I last spoke to some of you in mid-March, and that was an opportunity to reflect on an extraordinary 12 months, but also to reflect on how the future is starting to shape up for us. And what has truly become a sign of very rapidly changing times, even eight weeks later, much has changed. And we can add even more thinking and learning to how we shape the next 12 months. Today, I want to touch on some of that thinking, but I'll also speak to some of the wider challenges facing New Zealand in 2021, especially as we head into the budget. Last week, though, on Mother's Day, I found myself in Dunedin. I was speaking at an event, and as we wrapped for a cup of tea, a young woman approached me uh, to share a cheese roll recipe. Of the many things that people choose to share with me, this was a particularly welcomed one. I thanked her, and I took the opportunity to ask her a little bit about her story. She was from Invercargill. She had worked in tourism, but when COVID arrived, she lost her job. It was not long, though, before she found new work, doing food preparation as part of our food and schools program that provides free school lunches in areas of high deprivation. She is amongst the almost 1,000 jobs that have been created by the scheme, which we scaled up last year in response to COVID. Now, as I was listening to her tell me how much she loved her job, especially given she works out of her school's kitchen and therefore has what she described as instant and honest feedback from the kids, I couldn't help but reflect on why we had extended that program in the first place. We all know that when an economic crisis hits, it is not felt or experienced evenly. We know there are vulnerabilities people in precarious work, people who were already living in the margins of society, for whom life was already hard, and for whom it simply becomes that much harder. And we know that because even before COVID arrived, New Zealand had persistent issues we all know that we needed to address. Today, before I arrived at this event, we released the Child and Youth Wellbeing Annual Report and the Child Poverty Related Indicators Report. We committed ourselves to these two pieces of annual reporting when we introduced our child poverty and wellbeing legislation in our first term. Now, while we have made excellent progress with consistent declines across all nine of our child poverty measures across the last two years, we have a long way to go. Now, I personally see the issue of child poverty as a moral issue, but I've also heard many who hold the view, of course, that it is an economic one as well, with the loss of potential among our future workforce Either way, it is a challenge that requires an urgent response, both in spite of and because of the pandemic. And respond we have. The first packages we pulled together in the midst of COVID-19, it included, of course, funding for the wage subsidy, critical to keeping people in work, but also changes to benefits, the winter energy payment and the in-work tax credit. This is an example of where COVID is both a challenge, but also presents to us an opportunity. I remember sharing a Zoom call early on in the pandemic with Joseph Stiglitz. He talked extensively about the idea of double duty, or what we in New Zealand would probably just call two birds with one stone. The sense that we can and should ensure that in these difficult moments where we need to stimulate the economy, maintain employment and create new and sustainable jobs, we do so with an eye to the existing challenges we face. I want us to look back at this period and see that not only did we make it through, but we seized the moment to put New Zealand on a surer footing, better prepared to face the future. Let me give you some examples of where we're already working to do that. We have long been challenged by productivity issues, something persistently raised by both the IMF and OECD. We have a skills gap, coupled with massive underinvestment over many decades in infrastructure, including housing. All of that lends itself to two things, taking the time now to invest in those extensive building programs, but also investing in our people. Just last week, we reached a milestone we can be particularly pleased with, the highest number of building consents issued in New Zealand's history. Now we need to make sure we have the workforce to boot. COVID again provided two birds opportunities. Taking into account what we saw in the wake of the GFC, we moved quickly last year to establish the Targeted Training and Apprentices Fund. It makes a range of qualifications in targeted areas and all apprenticeships 
all apprenticeships free until the 31st of December 2022. These targeted areas include primary industries, construction, community support, manufacturing, mechanical engineering and technology, electrical engineering, road transport, conservation and information technology. I can tell you without a doubt, it has worked. A few weeks ago, I visited MIT and I was, I was walking through their amazing new learning environment for those in trade training. I was introduced to a woman studying electrical engineering. I asked her how she came to be in her new chosen trade. She told me it had been a long held passion, but life had originally taken her on a very different path. After leaving school, she spent several years as a travel agent, but was made redundant due to COVID. She said it was the fact she could study for free that finally gave her the impetus to take up the career she'd long aspired to. She is not alone. More than 100,000 learners have signed up for free vocational training and apprenticeships under this scheme, including more than 58,000 apprentices. Once qualified, these workers will support New Zealand's COVID recovery efforts and help drive our economy for years to come. That is double duty. But of course, our challenges don't end there. We're also undertaking a once in a lifetime transition to a sustainable carbon neutral economy. Here you can see the work we're doing to set the pathway for not just the next 10 years, but the next 30 years. The Climate Commission is due to report at the end of this month on its recommendations on how we reach our goals. And you can be sure that we'll continue using our recovery to expedite those plans. We'll have more to say uh, during the budget on this and over the remainder of the year. But our plan to address long-standing challenges also relies on us to continue to successfully manage the immediate and pressing issue that is COVID-19. Things are very different to where they were a year ago, and in fact, very different to even when I spoke to you in March. In March, India was recording less than 40,000 daily cases. Less than eight weeks later, they would record over 400,000. Meanwhile, the UK is now essentially allowing hugs between loved ones again and starting to trial outdoor music events. We've been lucky in New Zealand, but there is no question that COVID has come at a cost. Many employers and their employees have felt that acutely. That is why we owe it to them to make the most of the strong position we find ourselves in. Today, I want to build on the plan I set out in March and share with you both what we know and what we're less certain about as we move into the next phase of recovery. First, let me say from the outset that while the hard work of many has meant and our goods and our services have remained mobile in the last 12 months, our goal now is to move to reconnecting our people to the world. As a government, we see it as incumbent on us to do this in a way that maintains the position we have, an environment where we are free and safe from COVID because we don't yet have the individual armory to protect ourselves from the disease. That means for the time being, our borders remain that barricade we need against COVID. This has been our approach over much of the past year, what we call phase one or our keep it out phase of our COVID reconnection plan. But there are ways we can retain our elimination strategy while starting to rebuild contact with the world. You'll have seen us gradually begin to do this with the opening of the Trans-Tasman bubble. Since the bubble opened, more than 70,000 people have landed in New Zealand from Australia. Pleasingly, over 57,000 have traveled the other way. For me, keeping the numbers up uh, in one direction is our goal. The next stop will be quarantine-free travel with the Cook Islands, beginning this Monday. I'm going to call these arrangements phase two of the COVID reopening plan or the start of reconnecting our people to the world. Now, in this phase, where vaccine rollout in New Zealand is incomplete, we are limiting our reopening to those countries who hold the same status as us or who pose the same low risk of bringing COVID into the country. Nui is the next natural addition. Beyond that, we are relatively open-minded. And I do anticipate that there will be other countries we can explore opportunities with. But the list of possible opportunities here is limited. You can see from the Trans-Tasman bubble, expanding the team of 5 million to a team of 30 million 
is not without risk and some complication. And the bar we've set for whom we can safely operate such an arrangement with is high. But phase two, where we're currently sitting, and which represents that partial reopening, is in many ways a holding pattern. While we work on ensuring we lift the number of New Zealanders that have the individual armour of the vaccine. Here, high levels of uptake are critical. To date, the vaccine rollout is on track. In the last week alone, we vaccinated just shy of 80,000 people. A third of all doses that have been delivered have been delivered in the last fortnight, and the program continues to ramp up as intended. Later this month, all DHBs will be in a position to vaccinate over 65s, and by the end of June, we're aiming to have administered over a million doses. Throughout the rollout of the vaccine program, our approach has been to match our vaccination rate with our available supply. We wanted to avoid a position where we build capacity, build infrastructure and systems only to have to turn it off because we've run out of supply. We're also using this period to test systems such as the COVID-19 immunisation register, logistics, inventory management and the national booking systems that have been piloted in several DHBs across the country. I should note that even with planning in place, there is some risk, some risk that we'll have a period between shipments when we run low or we run out of vaccine temporarily. If this does happen, it would be prior to the larger deliveries we're expecting in July, but does speak to the difficulty in scaling up smoothly, ma managing eligibility, demand and supply in an uncertain environment. Come July, though, our vaccine rollout fundamentally changes. That's when we take larger stock and we can properly ramp up the program, reaching every New Zealander over the age of 16. DHBs are currently finalising their rollout plans for the general population, and in the weeks following the budget, we'll be able to set out in detail resourcing and logistics of the final phase of the program, including what individuals can expect in order to plan their own vaccination. These efforts will involve GPs, pharmacies, workplaces, marae, churches, some large community vaccination centres at more than 800 sites across the country. It will be challenging, but it will also be exciting. The business community's response to the challenge of COVID-19 has been critical and the vaccine rollout is no different. The private sector is already playing an important part in that rollout from logistics to shipping to workplace vaccination models to simply encouraging your people to get vaccinated. For that, I say thank you. But we need for us to continue to work together and that will only continue to grow as we aim to ensure every New Zealander who can be vaccinated is by the end of the year. So that brings me back to our reconnection plan. What does our vaccination rollout mean for us in terms of reconnecting our people? Here, let me share what we know, what we don't, and how we'll make decisions as part of phase three, which essentially is looking beyond the bubbles. The first question we're asking ourselves, and it's the same question that you've put to me, do we need to have completed our vaccine rollout in order to open our borders beyond the bubble arrangements we have? Will people who have been vaccinated in other countries be able to come in even if we haven't finished our own rollout? The answer is possibly. But there are two things we need to consider. We will be relying heavily on emerging evidence about how effective vaccines are in preventing not just symptoms of the disease but transmission between vaccinated individuals. Early data is promising. A recent study in the UK found the likelihood of household transmission was halved where an infected person had been vaccinated, on top of the vaccine being 90% effective at stopping infection in the first place. But as we see, no vaccine is fail safe. We've had our own recent example of a fully vaccinated border worker contracting COVID-19. If there's going to be an exception to the rule, New Zealand will find it. The second consideration alongside vaccine efficacy is the question of variants. At this stage, Pfizer is holding up well, but our reopening plan will need the flexibility to continue responding rapidly to countries where variants emerge that might pose a risk to the immunity we've built as a country or that we're working to build. 
And that's why as work continues internationally on vaccine passports, New Zealand will remain actively involved in those discussions, whilst also considering other tools for managing and monitoring risk at the border. And to those representatives from our airports in the room today, I really thank you for being so open to trialling and working on some of those options and opportunities. As planning for different possible ways to phase our reopening continue, we're leaning on the expertise and guidance of three particular groups. The Business Leaders Forum led by Rob Fife, the Continual Improvement Advisory Group that we set up that uh, um, Sir Brian Roche is leading, and then of course our public health expertise who are part of our advisory group led by Sir David Skegg. These groups have been invaluable. I cannot thank their chairs and members enough. And so while I cannot give you some definitive answers on where some of this work will eventually land, I can tell you we will keep an open mind. We'll listen to the science, we'll prepare ourselves to the range of opportunities that may arise, and we'll keep talking. In the meantime, there is much we can already do to maximise the opportunities we have before us. As well as international travellers coming into New Zealand quarantine free and New Zealanders returning home, strategic decisions continue to be made around border exemptions, particularly ones that will accelerate our recovery. Since June last year, we've been able to let in over 8,000 critical workers. On Monday, we announced that over the next 10 months, thousands of skilled and critical workers will be allocated spaces in MIQ to help boost key sectors. You might have heard this will include 2,400 RSC workers by March next year. The new allocations also include 300 specialised construction workers. We see them being particularly useful on the Auckland City Rail Link, Transmission Gully and the Christchurch Convention Centre. We're also putting aside MIQ space for 400 international students and that underscores the commitment we have to the international education sector. We'll continue to look at our border settings to make sure we're meeting businesses' needs, but I would highlight that at the moment Capacity and room is available uh, in our facilities, and I encourage you um, to use that. In terms of immigration going forward, though, last week we announced that the Productivity Commission will hold an inquiry into New Zealand's immigration settings. The inquiry will focus on immigration policy as a means of improving productivity in a way that better supports the overall well-being of New Zealanders. It will enable us, we hope, to optimise immigration settings by taking a system-wide approach, including the impact of immigration on the labour market, infrastructure and natural envi uh, environment. This sits alongside the work that we're already doing uh, and being led by Immigration Minister Chris Farfoy. In fact, this Monday, Minister Farfoy will be outlining the case for change in an immigration policy speech in Wellington. So if it's an area of interest, uh, I suggest you keep an ear out for that. But let me be clear on our driving goals here. We are looking to shift the balance away from low-skilled work towards attracting high-skilled migrants and addressing genuine skill shortages to improve productivity. The final component of reconnection that I wish to touch on today especially is trade, exports, and generating sustainable global investment to support our future growth. Our COVID response is part of what makes New Zealand an attractive proposition. We are seen as COVID free. We're seen as safe and stable, astute managers of a crisis and enjoying a strong recovery. This is compelling to business and investors who have been badly impacted by COVID overseas, but also a great brand proposition for exporters. We need to keep sending the message that New Zealand continues to be a great place to do business. And on this front, I have two announcements to make today. The first is that in early July, I will lead a trade and promotional delegation to Australia, New Zealand's first since the emergence of COVID. That will, of course, follow on from a visit from PM Morrison. I'll be looking to further strengthen business ties with our trans-Tasman partners. Also, next month, Trade Minister Damien O'Connor will travel to London and Brussels to progress negotiations for New Zealand's free trade agreements with the UK, in the EU. Securing high quality, comprehensive and inclusive FTAs with our EU and UK partners expands our market opportunities, playing a big part in our COVID trade recovery strategy and building on what have been long-standing traditional relationships. I can assure you as well that as with all returning New Zealanders, Minister O'Connor will undertake 14 days 
of MIQ upon return, or what we call a mystery shopper exercise, and will be vaccinated ahead of departure. I'd have to say it's, a, it's touch and go as to whether or not he's drawn the short straw or the long straw in this case. These trips may not have been overly notable pre-COVID, but they are hugely significant in light of the domestic realities. I can also assure you that when our key trading partners over and above Australia look to reopen their borders and we have greater movement between countries, I will look to lead delegations into Europe, the United States, China and the wider Asia Pacific. But equally, I want to make as much progress as we can in the here and now as well. Already this year I've spoken at the US Chamber of Commerce showcasing New Zealand's credentials as a stable country to invest in and do business with. With a change of administration there and deepening relationship with President Joe Biden across a range of issues, I intend to actively pursue an enhanced trade relationship with the US over the coming term. We will also to continue to roll out the $216 million of funding for NZT to help Kiwi firms retain and grow their global connections. We'll be looking to incorporate recent advice from the Productivity Commission on how that additional funding can further be targeted to support our exporters. To conclude though, let me leave you with a few parting thoughts as we enter into this week before the budget. Budget 2020 and through our COVID response last year, we laid the foundation really for New Zealand's economic success by supporting businesses and jobs. As a result, we've seen our economy performing much better than expected over the last 12 months. Our March quarterly benefit statistics showed a record number of people have come off the benefit with nearly 33,000 entering paid work. Unemployment dropped to 4.7% in the first three months of the year, well down on the 6.5% forecast and low when compared to the average jobless rate across the OECD, which sits at 67 and with Australia at 5.9. And as I've said before, exports remain resilient and firms also appear to be willing to invest more off the back of an improving environment, with imports of capital goods strengthening. Our success is also being recognised, not just in how we've handled the virus, but also in terms of that economic resilience. In February, as you'll recall, Standard & Poor's gave New Zealand the first ratings upgrade of any economy since the pandemic, and the first for New Zealand since 2003. And in the last few weeks, Moody's reported on our economy maintaining our triple A rating and noting our, quote, robust fiscal position when compared with our peers. Budget 2021 will be a continuation of our work to support the recovery, but we'll see our response become more targeted. We'll continue to focus on our key priorities, keeping New Zealanders safe from COVID, accelerating the recovery and rebuild, and laying the foundations for the future by addressing those long-term challenges such as housing, climate change, and child wellbeing. Double duty. We must continually ask ourselves, have we addressed the pressing challenge in front of us? But have we also taken hold of the opportunity to fix long-standing issues and leave all New Zealanders better off? We need to be aspirational, have a plan, but we also need to be disciplined and prioritise. Not all our commitments will be met in this budget. The past three years have demonstrated the benefits of careful management and targeted investment. Our strong position means we have an opportunity over time to bring down debt and put the government's books on a path to surplus. But our balanced approach will also see tens of billions of dollars open up for investment into infrastructure over the coming decade so we don't leave the next generation with debt of another kind. We ultimately, though, look forward to sharing the full budget with you next week. In the meantime, you will have picked up from my comments today that I feel optimistic about the remainder of 2021 and beyond. I feel confident in our plan and approach and heartened by our economic indicators. I remain proud of where we have got to, but also the potential of where we can finish. And now together, we need to keep going. So let's get on with it. Nōreira.